move on into this story. This is from WBKR 92.5, the country station. 32-year-old unsolved Kentucky murder mystery is absolutely gruesome. This was published March the 7th, 2022. And I'm just going to read this straight from this website. Everyone loves a good unsolved mystery until it shows up at your front door. Owensboro, Davis County is on the map for a 32-year-old murder mystery and the details are gruesome. The story dates back to the early 1990s according to several different media outlets. Two hunters were out hunting in the Philpot Pleasant Valley Road and came across a man's body, completely naked and missing his hands, feet, and teeth. Local authorities were called, and when they arrived, they found the man had been severely beaten and even shot. This reminds me somewhat of the story of, that I did on the man with no hands who was found in Kentucky inside of a barn, and his hands had been severed probably to try to remove fingerprints. The hands, feet, and teeth were all removed. Now the hands and teeth would be for identification reasons because they use fingerprints and dental records. Law enforcement officials believe that the man was between the ages of 25 and 40, but they couldn't be quite sure. They weren't able to get any fingerprints or identify him because everything had been removed. He was a white male between the height of 5 feet and 5 feet 7. He weighed around 140 pounds, and he had curly, medium brown hair with some gray around the edges. He was clean shaven at the time of his death, and he had blue eyes, dark blue eyes, and he had light complexion with tanned arms which would mean that he probably spent a lot of time outdoors, maybe in short sleeves. So he had lighter skin, but his arms were tan. While the man did not have on any clothes, there was a pair of gold-rimmed glasses found near his body. His face and skull had been beaten so severely that it was sunk in. He said he believed the man may have been brought here from Chicago and dropped. There is actual physical evidence leading back to a suspect if the DNA of the remains could ever be tested. The mutilated naked body of a young man laid in overgrown weeds. He had been dead for several days. His hands and feet were chopped off, his teeth had been yanked out, and his skull was crushed. Officials said you could not get where his body was found in a car. Could he have been an acquaintance to some of the people in the area? Back then, the only ones that would have known to pull his teeth would have been someone in the medical field or the law enforcement field. Well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, um, a lot of people were probably hearing about people being identified through their dental records. Some people speculate that he was a male prostitute and had been taken out there and dumped after having been murdered. Well, it is a little farther than I originally thought. Grant County is where the man with no hands was located. This is as you're going up into the area north of Lexington along the uh, area going towards Cincinnati. Now, Davies County is located farther west, closer to the Indiana area, and they believe that for some reason they speculated that this was a man from Indiana. I think the advancements in DNA today and I, I couldn't find anything if they had were doing new testing on him or not. Now, the man with no hands was found in a barn. 
I'm looking up to see what the date was on that. 1989. And the John Doe found in Davies County was in 1990. So very, very close proximity in, in time. The, these two cases were very close in time to each other. They were about three hours driving distance apart. Uh, the one found in Davies County was closer to um, Indiana. This is from Unidentified Wiki. It just says a man was found murdered in Owensboro, Kentucky in 1990. It was announced in April of 2022 that the Trans Doe Task Force was working on the case in association with the Kentucky State Medical Examiner's Office. Prior to being shot, the victim had also been beaten with a blunt instrument around his face and chest to, to the point of his face being barely recognizable. His facial features are described as having been obliterated with several teeth knocked out. Now, this says that he had several teeth knocked out. The other article said that his teeth had been removed purposely. The brutality of the crime suggested that it was premeditated and that the abuse and murder of the victim took place over a long period of time. So he may not have even been murdered in that area. He may have been murdered in Indiana or uh, even like someone else suggested, maybe Illinois and just driven there and dumped out once they were done murdering him. I don't know. I don't think they found blood and other uh, stuff around the area that would suggest he was alive when he was dumped out there. At the time of the discovery, his body did not have any hands and feet, and several of his teeth were missing. A retouch post-mortem of the photo of the victim shows damage to the entire middle portion of his face. The body was not decomposed, meaning he had not been out there long, and in the other article they said they thought he had only been out there a couple of days. Um, based on the fact that his arms were tan compared to the rest of the body, the victim was believed to have been from outside Owensboro, but it is believed that this that his killer was probably a local. So here is another uh, fact that was included that wasn't in the other article. Semen was found on or in the victim's body but attempts to use this evidence appear to not have been have led to any leaks. Well, if they were able to um, put that into CODIS or any other databases for DNA, if they still have those samples, tissue samples and semen samples and whatever else they might have been able to get, um, they may one day hit on a, um, you know, a match, or at least maybe a family member match. So they suggest that semen, that they say that semen was found on or in the victim's body. This is probably the reason why some people believed him to be a male prostitute. That's not necessarily true. This may have been someone who was in a relationship with someone in that area. In the initial investigation, it was believed the victim was killed as some part of a ritual sacrifice. A witness who lived not too far from this area said that they saw a white and green Ford pickup truck, likely a 1970s model, driving in the area on the evening prior to the body being found. Now, there's a man named James Cable, and police were investigating the possibility that a serial killer by this name, James Cable, and his accomplice, Philip Clopton, were responsible for the death. After a reporter discovered a possible connection, 
in 2004. Cable was active in Kentucky during the 1980s, and like this man, several of his victims had been raped and dismembered. Some had been beaten to death, and one of his victims was killed in Owensboro. It's also worth noting that all of Cable's confirmed victims were female. In April of 1990, shortly before the victim's discovery, Cable and Clopton kidnapped, raped, and tortured a 15-year-old girl from Jefferson County, Kentucky. However, the girl managed to break free and killed Clopton in self-defense. Cable was arrested shortly after that and died in prison in December of 2013. He never confessed to any crimes and investi investigators stated they would test DNA on this victim's body to see if it matched Cable's. If these tests were ever conducted, that is unknown. A spokesman for the Kentucky State Police in 2015 stated, the last time detectives received a possible lead was in May when the department received information about a suspect in another killing. The lead was investigated through DNA, but was determined that there was no connection to this body. And there's nothing here to suggest whether this was from one of Cable's victims. Um, misidentification, it says here that it was announced in 2007 that this was Scott Michael Morris who went missing from Indianapolis in 1978. Further DNA testing in 2010 stated that identification was mistaken if semen was found inside or on the outside of his body and it wasn't his of course <laughs> they should be able to you know CODIS is a uh, DNA database that is used anytime anybody is arrested and put into prison CODIS they take their DNA and it's put into this database so if other crimes come up, rapes and that type of thing, murders come up later, they can match DNA to anyone who may have been in the prison system. I don't know when they started taking DNA from um, prisoners. It's possible that whoever committed this crime died since this happened and maybe they didn't ever have any children. But they would have had cousins, you know, aunts and uncles and cousins out there. Maybe someone put their DNA into some genealogy database and maybe they will one day get a hit. It says here that the man was tortured and raped for an extended period of time before being shot and dumped in the woods. Now, I want to say something. But maybe it was those two serial killers, and maybe the fact that they had kidnapped a 15-year-old girl suggests that maybe they were picking up younger people, younger women. Maybe this victim was mistaken at first for a young woman. They said that they were only between 5 foot and 5 foot 7 inches tall weighed around 125 pounds. This would have been a small person, 125 to 140 pounds, um, with kind of thick, curly, longish like her. In this story, it's pretty much the same. It just says two hunters. Around 10 a.m. on January the 7th, 1990, two hunters came across a horrible sight in a thick briar patch. Covered in twigs and branches, they found the body of a nude man. They immediately called 911. Kentucky State Police Detectives Jared, Gerald Nickens and Sheriff Keith Kane arrived shortly after. An autopsy was performed and the brutality of the crime 
was enough to shake even the most experienced homicide detectives. The man had been tortured, beaten, and raped before being shot six times with a 22 caliber rifle in the head and chest. One of the bullet holes was above and behind his left ear, indicating he was shot and killed execution style. After the autopsy, the, the autopsy showed that the person who did this had beaten the man with a blunt instrument for an extended period of time before killing him. They probably tried to beat him to death, and when he didn't die, they just started shooting. And a twenty-two is a hunting rifle. Most people use a twenty-two for hunting, you know, certain game. That's what maybe leads these people to believe that whoever did this knew, you know, was from this area, knew this area. At the crime scene, police were able to collect a few pieces of evidence, including five 22 caliber bullets and a pair of gold tone prescription glasses found a few feet from the body. Semen was co collected from the sexual assault and a cadaver dog was brought into the area in hopes of recovering the man's hands and feet, but they were never found. Investigators have been quick to point out that the perpetrator likely did this in an attempt to hide the identification of the victim. It makes sense for someone to have their victim's hands removed, but it is more difficult to understand. Well, maybe, I know this sounds a little out there, but maybe they carried his body into these woods in some kind of a duffel bag or some kind of a cooler or something so that if someone saw them walking along you know another hunter came along they would wouldn't question it too much so maybe they removed the feet in order to make the body fit into this um, container I don't know that's just a suggestion They believe the man was not from Kentucky due to the fact that he had a tan on his arms. And this was January. And there's very little possibility of getting a tan in Kentucky in January. They suggested that he might be from Chicago, but I would think it would be even colder in Chicago. Is it possible that he was from down south? Could he have been some type of migrant farm worker? And it's a possibility that there were more than one perpetrator here because of the fact that he was found in this thick wooded area. It might have taken more than one person to carry him out there. Maybe he was still alive when they took him out there and he walked out there. Since the discovery of the man's body, the case has been reopened on three separate occasions and the body was exhumed at one point. Over the years, investigators have been to multiple states and interviewed many different people, including people in prison, but have not come up with any conclusion to this. Kentucky State Police Public Affairs Officer Ed Brady said that he does not believe that this had anything to do with a cult. It could be a rumor perpetrated by the media, which isn't surprising. Uh, they like sensationalism. They like to keep their ratings up. They like to keep people tuned in. And um, So they're saying the case was mishandled because of the misidentification of this man's body. In 2007, it was reported that John Doe had been identified as Scott Michael Morris, a boy who disappeared at the age of 14 in 1978. Kentucky State Police Detective Juan Mormon, who had been assigned to the case, found the connection while combing through the database. Immediately, he sent photos to the Morris family and told the detective that they were 100% sure it was him. 
The family was so confident that they thought that this was their family member that they immediately drove to the area where the body had been found. They were even sure that they knew who had killed him. A man they thought had kidnapped him when he was a young boy. While they told reporters that they were heartbroken that Scott was dead, they found comfort in knowing that he would finally be able to get a proper burial. However, unknown to them at this time, they were about to get more heartbreak. A local news program interviewed the family in 2007 and reported that Mormon received verbal confirmation from a lab in Texas that this was their son even though the DNA results had not even come in yet. It is unknown who told the investigators it was Scott or why they did this. Maybe the family was just hoping so much that it was him and maybe they hadn't seen this person since he was 14. Maybe they really believed. So then in April of 2009, it was reported that this had been a false identification and that the DNA results had come back saying that this was not Scott Michael Morris. Another theory that the police had was that when discussing this case, it came up that James Cable and his accomplice, Philip Clopton, were involved in this murder. The possible connection was revealed in April of 2004 by a journalist, Stephanie Sylvie of 14 News. She had been reporting on this case for several years. James Cable was a serial killer who raped, murdered, and dismembered between three and five women and girls, and at least two of them had been beaten to death. One of the victims was found in Owensboro, Kentucky. On April the 5th, 1990, at about four months after John Doe was found, Cable and Clopton had kidnapped a 15-year-old girl from Louisville, Kentucky. In the span of three weeks, they raped and tortured the girl, but she was able to steal Clopton's gun and kill him and run to safety. Cable was captured shortly after, and he died in prison in 2013 without ever having confessed to his crimes. It is unknown if any other aspects of this case, besides the proximity to the murders, really have a connection. Um, like they said, there was DNA, there was semen found on the body of this murder victim. I'm sure that they took DNA samples from Clopton and Cable. Um, it seems so cut and dry and so easy to us listening to this and talking about these cases. They have the DNA. Why don't they just test it? Why don't they just see who it belonged to? At least, if nothing else, they could rule these people out and move on to searching for who this could be. But you know who this could belong to, and if that person is still out there, and if they are uh, doing this to other people as well. It, like one theory that I said was, this man, they said was around five foot tall to five foot six, small in stature, around one hundred and twenty five, hundred and thirty five pounds. Like I said. This is just a theory that I'm throwing out there. He he could have been a feminine type man, and these men may have mistaken him for a woman at first, or they may very well have known he was a man and just took him anyway. Um, because their theory, the police's theory, is that it probably wasn't them because all of their other victims had been women that they know of. The um, Trans Doe Task Force, according to their website, the victim was added to their LGBT 
accountability for missing and murdered persons. So there, they added this um, victim to their databases and, and included this person in their categories because they believe he could have been a transgender or some theories was that he was a male prostitute but maybe he was actually dressing as a female I don't know I, I'm just, this is just another theory and this is one of the reasons why they added this person to their um, they said that there were sensitive details they were not going to talk about here this begs the question do investigators have a reason to believe that the victim was transgender if so could Cable and Clopton have kidnapped her thinking that this was a woman and this was my theory as well. This is all speculation, of course. In any case, investigators have stated that they'd test the DNA found on the body to see if it belonged to Clopton or Cable. It is unknown to the public whether they ever did this. So then they get into talking about the Grant County John Doe. This John Doe was shot with a twenty two caliber gun in Grant County, which is around a three-hour drive. Now, this was the man that I mentioned in the video that I did, and I mentioned at the beginning of this that was uh, referred to as the man with no hands. Another conversation that comes up a lot when talking about this case is the similarities between the case of the Grant County John Doe, who was also shot with a twenty two caliber gun and his hands had been severed. What was really interesting to online sleuths is the fact that Grant County John Doe was also found nude and his hands had been severed. However, there are more differences in those cases than similarities. Now, if I'm remembering this one, the man with no hands, the Grant County John Doe, he was a very large man, um, and he could, I don't think anyone would have mistaken him for a woman because they said that he had a very um, sharp haircut of, a, of like a military style sharp haircut, and he was just a very large person. He was like six foot five or something of that nature. The Grant County John Doe, the man who was found in the barn with his hands removed, was found nude. He had not been beaten. He had not been sexually assaulted. He had been shot with execution style and um, his hands removed, probably to remove fingerprints. He had been shot twice in the back of the head. So a lot of people do not believe that there's um, a connection between these two cases. The Davis County John Doe was a white male between the ages of 25 and 40 and was a small in stature of around 125 to 135 pounds. Some people believe he was only five foot tall. Others say he was around five foot six. His hair was eight inches long and was curly and brown. He had brown eyes and natural teeth with some fillings. While no clothing were found with his body, there was a pair of men's gold tone glasses found on the ground nearby. And that's pretty much all there was to this story. Um, if you have any tips, if you know anything about this, you can contact the Kentucky State Medical Examiner at 502-489-5209. You may also contact Kentucky Crime Stoppers 
and you can remain anonymous at 270-687-8484. Thanks for listening.